Welcome to the Gentleman Project Podcast. I'm Kirk Chug. And I'm Corey Moore. Today we have an awesome guest. Scott O'Neill was a reference to us by Derek Porter. Thank you, Derek, by the way. Uh, we're excited to have Scott. He, uh, his last job after, before taking a break, Scott, right, was being the CEO of the 76ers and their parent company. Correct? Yes, it was. Yeah, we, the New Jersey Devils of the NHL. Okay. We had, obviously, the Philadelphia 76ers and the whole trust the process adventure. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had an investment platform where we had a venture fund, an innovation lab. We had a real estate company, an esports platform, built a sports marketing company, had a whole, built a Grammy Museum, had a whole bunch of fun. It was great. An unbelievable eight years. So, so my you, definition was pretty weak. <laughs> like, I actually didn't realize you had all that under your, under your hat at one time. Yeah, That's it was great. amazing. You know, I've spent a career in sports. And so from Madison Square Garden to the NBA, to the Nets, to the Philadelphia Eagles, and then HBSC, and then, then, a, then a year of freedom. So it's been a, been a great adventure. I can't wait to get into that. Uh, you also recently written a book. I have. And it's called Be Where Your Feet Are. If you look at Scott's, LinkedIn profile. It is prominently positioned right in the front. Uh, and so I know that that's really important to you. We can't wait to talk to you about, about what that book means. Uh, I know that came out around the same time that you kind of took a break and stepped away. Right. So tell us a little bit about why you wrote the book and what the book's about. And then maybe we can delve into some of the things you teach in that book. Cause it's right up the alley of this podcast. Sure. I think it came out my last day. Um, oh, job, really? It was pretty amazing. So, um, yeah, Be Where Your Feet Are um, was written, kind of uh, reluctantly written, if you will. Uh, I, I, don't, I didn't have any aspirations of writing a book. Um, my best friend, um, unfortunately, died of suicide. And by the way, that's the correct term, died of suicide, not take your own life or um, committed suicide. Um, <clears throat> so he died of suicide. A uh, dear friend of mine, best friend, went to business school together. Um, his, his kids call me Uncle Scott. You know, mm. I, my kids call his, his uncle will, uh, five kids, successful guy, wonderful wife, and, uh, was suffering from, from depression. And when I got the call, I spiraled in down into a hole and into a place that I had never been. And, um, and writing became my escape. <clears throat> um, and so it's, if you've ever seen the movie Forrest Gump, there's a scene in that movie, which I never understood is he's playing football for the university of Alabama and, and he's running back a kickoff and he runs, I guess it runs through all the way, gets a touchdown. And it just runs out of, out of the stadium, if you remember it. Mm -hmm. And then he keeps going. He ends up running across the country. And then people follow him and all this other nonsense. But effectively, like, that's the, that's the closest equivalent to how I felt when I was writing. Um, because I wasn't running to anything, and neither was Forrest Gump. He was running away. And so I was trying to write away. Like, and by that, I was just, I needed an escape. And, and what I found myself continuing to write about were times that I fell, um, the lesson I learned and who helped me along the way. And so that's what it became mm. and had a dear friend of mine, uh, Randall Wright <clears throat> kind of came to see me and it wasn't just a coincidence. I, I married an incredible woman, um, met her at the nets. She was an intern. I was a secretary. So, uh, we met when we were really young, but her dear friend came to visit. I think she called him and said, Hey, you gotta, this guy's struggling. And he came in and said, how are you doing? I said, good. <laughs> like like any on. guy in the world would yep. say, right? Everything's fine. I can do it. I'm Superman. You know, let me just hop into a phone booth. And he's like, you really doing okay? He said, I understand you're writing. I was like, yeah. He's like, let me see it. I was like, you know, it's really my own stuff. He said, well, what are you writing about? I said, it's just like a journal. I just write. He said, well, you're writing a lot. I said, yeah, a few hours a day. So I was working. I could hold it together at work pretty good. And I'd just come tuck into my, my um, study and just write. And just, you know. That's me banging the keyboard. Um, and then he said, well, what if, what if you publish this? You know, he's a guy who published 12 books. And I said, yeah, I'm not, this is like my innermost thoughts. This is my like worst vulnerabilities. This is mm -hmm. not what I want it to be. You know, he said, well, what if you could, could help one person? <laughs> Just one person, one. And I was like, well, then I would do it. And he said, well, Scott, you're going to help one person because people need to see people like you, whatever that means people like you be vulnerable people like people need to like a, peek, a real peek behind the curtain and we don't get it. And, um, and so then I, I went down the journey and, and um, we ended up publishing the book. It became a bestseller. It's a really cool experience. I've spoken all over the place. Um, and COVID seems to have been, it seemed to be the right book at the right time in COVID where I, I talk a lot about 
mental health and being healthy and mm. just taking care of yourself. Do something for your mind, something for your body, something for your soul every day. Practice gratitude, get the right amount of sleep, and then put your phone down and get your head up. It's kind of the formula. And um, we've talked about a whole bunch of concepts. It's just a very different uh, book than you would expect from a sports CEO. Yeah. And I remember when I was talking to my agent, she's like, I have great writers for you. I was like, nah, you know, she's like, you know, this guy writes for ESPN. This guy writes for Fox Sports. I was like, yeah, that's not what this is. And so I ended up um, working with a woman who wrote Dr. Phil's books, you know? So it, it, <laughs> it's, it's a very, very different flavor that I think that people talk about. And um, I had a kind of a strange occurrence that happening parallel to this is during COVID the NBA shut down. And, and we created a bubble, we called the bubble in Orlando. And so everybody went down to the bubble and I was fortunate enough to be down there for, for some time. And, um, and the first game I went to in the bubble, it was just me. So it was an NBA game and I was the only fan. It was a surreal experience. The second day I walk into a game and they're huge because we didn't know what the heck was happening at COVID at that point, right? Huge plex plexiglass, we're 10 feet away, we're separated. So I was like me and then a person on my right and a person on my left. To my left was Adam Silver, the commissioner. To my right was um, uh, Bob Iger, Disney, chairman of Disney. And he, I don't know if you read his book, but put that on your list. It's called Ride of a Lifetime. And so, you know, during the break, I got a chance to say hello to him. And I just said, um, I said, hey, um, what I love, I read your book and loved it. And he said, oh, that's so gracious. And I, I know that feeling now. It's really humbling. Like strangers reach out to you. They like, stop you in, in the street that's or cool. get you on LinkedIn. It's a really cool feeling. I mean, it's really yeah. humbling. And they have these amazing stories about how like something you said just hit them at the right time. It's like really humbling. And I said to him, I said, you know, I said, I just want to tell you about something I love most about your book and it might surprise you. And he said, yeah, what is it? I said, in the book, he talks about when he was going to be CEO and chairman of Disney and he had a nervous breakdown. And I said, I think that was so courageous. And I said, there's so many of us out here just scratching and clawing and fighting a good fight. And like, I don't know, I just feel like, grateful that you let your hair down, you know, that you actually put, got us a peek behind the curtain and saw like what that stress and pressure and anxiety and the world is collapsing around you really feels like. And, um, and that's what I, a lot of what I tried to do and capture in my book. And, and it's not a, a downer. It's, it's, it's hope. It's full of hope and, and it's uplifting, but, but it does take you on the roller coaster of life because that's what life is. Like life is messy. And I always, I have a big smile on my face, uh, but because you, you have this vision and version of what you think it is. I look at you, Kurt, you, um, Corey, and I say, okay, I can imagine what your life is. I have no idea. And we all have things that are happening in our lives. It could be with, you know, our partner, spouse, relationship, children, work, family, community, church, faith. You know, we all go through these different struggles in life. And, um, and I, th I think it's a blessing, and I appreciate what, what you guys do here. It gives us an outlet to talk about some of those, those things. Have you talked to your girls about this book? Have you guys had conversations about what's in there and, and to your wife about the book? And has it affected those relationships or the way they look at you or talk to you about things? Well, they're, they're in the book. I mean, all of them. Okay. You know, this is like, this is a rip the bandaid off, okay. open the kimono and talk about what the heck really happens behind closed doors. And, um, and so each of them, and I've, I've learned a lot of lessons from each of them. My, my youngest, Eliza, who's 16 now, which I can't believe. <laughs> Um, you know, she has gone through the, she's been through the mill. COVID did not do her right. Um, and she was really, really struggling. And, and it did give us a common language, which I love, I love common language. I use it at work, at home, church. I just like when we have a common language, we have issues and problems. And, um, and so it gave us a platform to have conversations. And, and what Eliza's taught me is, um, she, she's been keeping for almost four years now, um, a gratitude journal where she writes down 14 things that she's grateful for every night before she goes to bed. They've been unique. Think about that. How incredible. Yeah, that that's like amazing. Team. Now think about the power of that. Like I think gratitude is, is the, it's the best superpower in the world. She also has a happiness clicker, which she doesn't use as much anymore, but during COVID you go by a room, she'd be like, click, click, click. And it was happy thoughts. And now you might think, wow, this might be the happiest kid in the world. She must be singing sunshine. She's not like, it's a self-defense mechanism. Mm -hmm. Like she's actually working against her inner nature is not positive. She does not wake up happy. And so she knows she has to feed the beast. And I love that about her, you know? Uh -huh. And my middle one's different. My middle one is she's serving a mission uh, for the Church of Jesus Christ Latter-day Saints right in Temple Square, right across the way here. And, um, and she does wake up like sunshine. <clears throat> and so for her, 
a lot of what we talked about, you know, are, are some of the principles about API, which is assume positive intent. And so that's something that we have a lot of conversations about. She has very high expectations for herself and she has very high standard for herself. And, and, and I think what she's, what I've learned from her is, you know, just about giving people grace um, because you know, everybody's on their own personal journey. And, and, and the more you can be full of, of love and, and, and less judge, um, which I spent a lot of time talking about our, our uh, lovely church members about. Um, <clears throat> and then my oldest, Alexa, who's a senior at UVU and uh, is getting into the sports business, which tickles my heart for sure. <laughs> <clears throat> she says internships with the Jazz and U.S. skiing snowboard and now um, Free All Salt Lake. So, so she definitely has the bug. Uh, but she, where I learned from her is just, she has an unbridled joy for life. And, and sometimes I forget that I'm, I'm generally happy and positive and I like life and I wake in with big eyes, but every time I see her, <clears throat> I just, I just remember, you know, there's just wide nose eyes, like look at the world, smile a little bit more, you know? And, and so, so yeah, so I, I think what the book has done for, for my daughters and I is just given us a platform to talk. Now, did they give me a hard time about publishing a book? Yes, they have. We, <laughs> we, we don't have the, uh, the, 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 the utmost um, <clears throat> respect that you have for your grandfather. That doesn't exist in our house. We're, we're, <laughs> we're New York street fighters. So, uh, so yeah, we had some laughs for sure. Uh, and my wife, she's a very private person. Um, and, and we've lived a very public life for her. I think it was, it, it, it pushed her, into a different, out of her boundaries. And, and her boundaries, is, you know, so we've been asked to speak quite a bit, in, in particular on the church front. And, and my, we always say, yeah, anything church-related, we say yes. Maybe almost, I don't think we've ever said no. So we just say yes. And, um, and I said, my only rule is, if I speak, you speak. And that's, that's, you know, <laughs> and, you know, for me, I can walk into a room with three bullet points and talk for an hour. For her, she's got to prepare for three weeks and then agonize over the details. Um, and, and seeing her, um, seeing her evolve as, as a, a leader, a coach, a counselor, an influencer, a mentor, it's been so special for me to see her just blossom. Um, <clears throat> she, I just can't speak after her anymore. It's my only hook. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't follow her anymore. It's bad. Um, and, I, and I also like the counterbalance of just having a strong woman, you know, particularly when you talk to, to youth groups. You know, as a dad of three girls, you know, I, I oftentimes – like to surround my, my daughters around really strong women, you know, in different ways. You know, if they can have strong faith, strong moms, strong career-wise, but I just like strength in women. And, um, and I, I, I love the notion of, of them looking up and seeing my wife. And she's strong and tough. I mean, you know, I, uh, you know, she's a strong member of the church, born into the faith. You know, I went 22 years uh, without being baptized. So, and she kept the house just full of love and the savior and we read scriptures and prayers and I went to church and we, you know, she, she held down the fort and I want this, everyone, especially the women in there. I like the young men to look up and say like, yeah, that's the kind of woman I want to marry for sure. But also the young women to say like, I can do this. Like I'm tough. I'm strong. I'm smart. Like I, I have this, you know, and I think she's a great example of that. That's incredible. I've, I've had this, um, this thought to ask you how you're doing now after you've published this book, you know, you were, you were in a pretty dark place after your best friend died of suicide. How are you doing now after the book? I know the book was your therapy. How are you now? Yeah. Well, I'm as healthy uh, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually than I ever have been in my life. Um, now part of that is the cathartic nature of writing a book. Part of that is not working, not having a, a, like, I guess a traditional nine to five job. Um, and part of that is <clears throat> I'm stretching, I'm stretching myself, you know, in, in all aspects of my life, I have a window of time uh, to try to figure out what I want to do, where I want to spend my time. Um, I, I took a trip with there's a, a Utah based company called HXP run by an incredible executive, Amy Antonelli. And, um, and they sent uh, young people all over the world on these trips they build schools and houses. And I went to Mozambique with my daughters like three weeks in Mozambique, living in pretty rough conditions, um, not speaking a language. I got sick over there. And, it, and I learned life lessons that I'll carry with me forever. Um, I coached high school basketball. Uh, we won a state championship. 
Go yeah, team. Go team. And, I, <laughs> and and the notion of coaching my daughter is just the coolest, most incredible experience. I've um, I've signed on. I'm, uh, I'm an advisor and investor in six early stage companies. And so I love technology and new things. And I love entrepreneurs. And I love the way they think and the way they grind. Um, and so that's opened my my mind and, and the way I think. And then, you know, it's I have space, space and time. And that's that's the one thing that I think is really hard when you're when you're in you know when you're in the mix. When you're you know, I was working I've been working for 25 years. <laughs> COVID gave me a family dinner by the way, which we can talk about. Like I hadn't been a family dinner in 20 years. I'm working literally at Madison Square Garden, 180 nights a year till midnight. Wow. You know, my last job, Sixers, Devils, esports, concerts, 150 nights a year. And wow. so, so that, that's, you know, and, and it's not, you know, it doesn't stop. And so do you have pockets wow. when you're off? Sure. Can you take vacation? Yeah. It's, 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 but, but for the most part, I'm getting home when everybody's asleep. And, and I didn't have the discipline to, to uh, go in late. So I would be, you know, taken off at seven. So, and that, that's a, that's a hard grind. And so when you're in that grind and you're trying to build value and you're responsible for thousands and thousands of people and, you know, you know, the impact you can have in the community and the church and at home, and you're trying to figure out like where you spend your time. Um, <clears throat> COVID taught me a ton of lessons and I, I know COVID was tragic and I know people lost their lives and got sick and the economy collapsed. I know there was a ha- ton of bad, but it was also amazing, great lessons for me. So tell us a little bit about those lessons. Cause I'm, you know, I'm, I'm one of those people who's having to work quite a few hours and I'm trying to balance that right with what I'm doing at home and what you're doing at church and, and many other things, podcast, you name it. So talk to us yeah, about what sure. are those lessons that you learned? And, yeah. you know, if you jumped back into that work world, how would you do things different based that, on those lessons? That is the most wonderful question. Um, well, first off, I, I, I'm never, never been much a believer in balance, the word balance. I think it's the wrong question. I, when I speak to young groups, it always surprises me because at 22, you shouldn't be asking me about balance. You shouldn't. You should just work 50, you know, 50 60, 70, whatever it takes. I did. You know, I just want, I was really driven. And I grinded. Um, <clears throat> but the next, this next generation, they're different. They're a lot smarter than we are, for, you know, for sure. They definitely understand the world. They're global citizens. Um, they understand diversity at a different level than we ever, ever can possibly imagine. Like the way we see our parents and their understanding of diversity, they see us. Like that's the quantum leaps they're making. They are really smart. They understand our brands. They understand their brands. As CEOs, they're looking at you and they're saying like, do I believe in what you're doing? Do I believe in what you stand up? Because if I don't, I'm just walking out the door. I don't care. I don't have a house. I don't have a car. I'm out. Where are you going? The DR to surf. What? Can you imagine being 25 years old, just walking away? We couldn't do it. We didn't no have way. it. We didn't but, have but that. But that's a gift of freedom they have. And so, <clears throat> so therefore, as CEOs, like, they're looking at you. They're looking at what you wear, looking at what you say, looking at where you eat. They want to know <laughs> where you spend your time because they want, they want to be aligned. And if they're not, they're just going to tap out. Um, and so, um, so for me, what I learned in COVID was in, in a book we call WMI, what's most important. So, so to truly go through the exercise and waiting what my WMI is. And that's a daily practice. That's not like, hey, let me lay out on a, on a piece of paper. My family's, because everyone's going to say this thing. What's important? My family. My relationship with my wife. No. Yes. Therefore, what? Because life is about trade-offs. That's what you have to understand. And so my notion um, is about being present. And so think about your life. You both have kids, I assume. Yeah. A lot. Both, a few, a bunch. Three. Four. Three. Okay. What ages? Mine are 16, 13, and okay, nine. You're in the thick of it. I like that. 17, 15, 15. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're both in the thick of it. I like that. <clears throat> good, good. That's pain. That's good pain. Like that. <clears throat> Hopefully you have a teenage girl. You'll, you'll earn that one too. Um, we both we have both, teenage girls. Okay, we both good do. for you. We can talk about that offline. <laughs> I don't think we're putting that one on the, on the mic. Um, so so I, in our house, I'll talk about our house because I don't, I, I don't want to presume, you know, be presumptuous about what's in your house. Our mornings, full on chaos. Like there is, there's no quality time. Like for us, we call it the NCAA tournament, survive in advance in our house. Get the girls out of the house to school without a complete nuclear meltdown. Somebody's computer isn't charged. Someone took my phone. You're wearing my shirt. Where's the milk? Where's the, it's always, something. there's no, like you are not teaching a life lesson to your kid at seven in the morning before they go to school. It's not happening. 
And so you just understand like, okay, I'm, and my wife's a stay at home mom. And so I know that I'm better and she's better if I'm there. So the, so's the house. And so I try to spend some time and doing things like humbly, like, and my wife, she's like, fill up the water bottle, you know, go cut those carrots. I mean, you know, I'm like, all right, you know, grab the garbage while you're out there. Okay. You know, so, but I try to be, be, uh, uh, be her humble partner at that point. And then like for most of us, we, we go to work, right. And they go to school and then you got, you know, our house, you know, we have cheerleading and basketball and softball and got boyfriends, which I definitely don't want to talk about. And we got homework, right. And you're still working and you're grinding. You got a business dinner and then you got something for church. You got to run to, and you're just trying to keep it all together. And then like, when's the quality time happening? Cause it's not like, if you think with teenagers in both your houses, that's like, yeah, I'm, I'll be home. Well, here's what's happening. Not for you. I'm not pointing fingers. I'm saying around, around this country. What's happening is we're coming home. We're flipping on the TV. We're all scrambling. We're not having dinner together because it's impossible because of all the different schedules. We're like, I'm, I'm just going to make some nachos tonight. We're, we're good. Then I've got my, my iPad open. I've got my phone here. I've got something up. The kid's playing a video game, doing their homework. Like, it's crazy. And so what, what, I, what, I, what I learned or what I might suggest or, or, or offer to you if you haven't done it yet is just one hour. One hour a day. No phones, no TV, no electronics, no video games, no AR headsets. We all be for an hour. Now, how you manage that as a dad is cool, you know? And during COVID, I had the best experiment because, and I'm, I consider myself very close with my ladies, okay? I'm very close with my girls, very, very close. I, I feel like I know them very well. I wasn't really equipped at that point to just like, like facilitate a meeting. <laughs> so I got, this is really embarrassing. I got conversation starter cards. Can you imagine? And so that's how we started. Then, it, you know, but like that was a time we were talking about social justice. We we're talking about politics. We're talking about that's the awesome. of the president. We're talking about life. We're talking about the sports business, the impact of COVID. We're talking about, hey, what's this like in China right now? What is actually happening? And we actually had real conversations around real topics over time. And that's continued. And so, so I just, I would encourage you to carve out some time. Everyone says, I already do that. I was like, okay. Just check yourself, like honestly go through an audit. And then the weekends are wild because that's when we actually have some window. I didn't always because of my work. I, I worked a lot of weekends, but, but generally we have some time, but you know, we need a break too. It's like, where's your break? If your break is golf. Great. If your break, if your break is watching the Utes, I don't know, football. I have no idea what your break is, but we need some time. What is that time? You know, and how do you get it? And then how do you still stay connected? As your kids are like, and they, um, hopefully you have a wonderful relationship with your kids and they love you and they want to spend time with you. And that's awesome. I have that. I'm, I'm really blessed that way. But they have lives, you know? And so I just want to make sure that the time we have is well spent. Yeah. We're getting to that point where, you know, friends are more important uh, to spend time with than, than mom and dad. They're not the coolest people in the room anymore. And uh, it's been hard for me to come to a realization of that. And, you know, sometimes I think people experience that. And then as their kids mature and get older and friends move away, hopefully you've developed that relationship that they come back and you're adult friends with your kids. Um, but that's been, that's been a struggle for me to kind of wrap my head around like my 11 year old still likes to be around me, yeah. you know, and she's, she's my buddy, but I've seen it happen with my three older ones and they now all have jobs and they're hard workers and they're great kids. And, but I, I've kind of come to that realization that I don't have, um, I don't have as much time with them on a daily basis. And I know Corey and I both kind of thought this as you were saying this, but that is the, that is the origin story behind the gentleman project was me coming home late at night, right before the kids went to bed and me realizing if I don't carve out time right now, and teach them something of substance right now. They've gone an entire day without any influence from me. And that's where the gentleman project actually came from. That's great. Um, so I know that we both identify with that story so well. Yeah. And what you said about the way life was going in your mornings and your evenings yeah. and your weekends and you name it, that was spot on for us. For <laughs> sure. It was spot on. Well, and many people that are probably listening to the podcast feel the same way, like, hey, you just described my life. You know? I, I will say too. I'm, I'm, I'm sure you do plenty of this stuff. We, we, may, it's a party at our house all the time. So we want their friends at our place all the time. 
And so we are, we are much more liberal than our instincts allow, you know, in terms of, you know, movies and uh, games and staying up late and music and everything that we, you know, kind of bristle at. Um, we, have, we have rounded our edges out knowing that this is a home that we want to be fun and we'd rather the kids be in our house. You know, we don't, we don't live in Utah, you know, we live in the East coast and it's, it's a hair rougher and a hair more of an adventure. And, um, and so we want our the house, we want the kids to come over and it's, it's amazing. The kids, what they say is they all describe it differently. And this is all, all my wife's doing. Unfortunately, I can't take any credit, but they always say they feel a lot of love here. It feels really warm here. I feel really comfortable being here. So you can, you can, we, we have Nerf gun wars in our house <laughs> all the time. We have 15 Nerf guns. Okay. They flip off all the lights. My wife and I play, you know, and we have rules and, you know, we have like killer wiffle ball game out in our front yard. <laughs> we like, you know, we have a pool, which is fun. We, we do a whole, a whole host of things out there. There's food everywhere all the time. There are buckets of candy everywhere. We, you know, and, and it's not, I got great advice from a friend of mine. His name was Henry Johnson. He runs a Northern trust, the big trust company. And I was, um, I was in this group YPO. It's, um, I don't know if you know YPO. It's a young presence organization. Anyway, a bunch of, uh, executives get together and I was, I was frustrated one night cause I've been working extremely hard. I was traveling internationally a lot at that point. So you get home and you are just like, your head is spinning and there's just stuff everywhere. I mean, my, my oldest was probably 13 or 14 at the time, just their clothes. And I was just like, what the, I can't, I need order, you know? Um, and, and he said to me, he said, uh, he said, Scott, how much, how much time you got left before it was Alexa? Uh, Lex rolls for college. I was like, wow, four years. He's like, okay, well, how do you want to spend that time with her? I was like, huh, what? Because I knew everything at that point, of course. I was like, what are you talking about? He said, well, you know, you could, you got a choice, right? You could spend time telling her to put her stuff in the hamper, or you can talk to her about, you know, what it's like to, to date and what she looked for in a guy she wanted to date. And I was like, right. So I think like that was like the start for us. We started saying like, okay. And again, we, we had so many missteps. Like <laughs> I remember when Alexa was going to college, she was a year away. My wife and I looked at each other one night, we were laying in bed, kind of laughing. And I was like, can she iron? <laughs> She's like, Scott, she can't even boil water. And so that night we made a list of all the stuff we wanted her to learn in the next year. And we just checked it off. Yeah. And it became the funniest thing. We had a big list on the fridge and their friends would come over and we'd have do laundry night, you know, and we, we, you know, it was really funny, but, uh, but we had a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of fits and starts, but I, I think generally for us, like making sure that home, not only for our kids is a safe place, but there's a pack of kids here all the time and we love it. That's great. You guys started doing a lot of things on purpose. It sounds like. So I have to tell you, <clears throat> I didn't remember this and still use until you started talking about your wife, but you did an, uh, all in podcast that I listened to probably a year ago. So I had forgotten the details of it, but I remember getting emotional during that when you were talking about your wife and about, I think you had like kind of talked about your love story, if I remember. And, and you could just tell that you guys had a great relationship. Um, and it reminded me of my relationship with That's my wonderful. wife, Thank which you. is why I got emotional, <laughs> you know, but yeah. so talk to us about, you know, the relationship with your wife and how does that relationship affect your family dynamic and you, you know what your girls look at yeah marriage is is complicated and hard and um and and, and wouldn't it be nice if it were like the fairy tales <laughs> wouldn't that be wonderful you know <laughs> everything's awesome you know we're skipping down the street holding hands and and um and, and we learned at a really young age you know we, we both come from very strong families which is helpful you know um but we both work we both work at it every single day and so, um, we, boy, you know, I think when you have daughters and I, I, maybe I'd have been the same if I had sons. I don't, I don't, so I don't know. Um, but, but the more I've read, the more I've learned that, you know, oftentimes the, the best way to be a role model for who your daughters are going to marry is the way you treat your wife. And, um, and my wife, she's, I mean, she's an amazing woman. I, I talked about it before, so I don't, I don't want to gush. Uh, but that doesn't mean she's an easy woman. And it doesn't mean that, you know, she doesn't have strong, strong, strong voice. And doesn't mean she doesn't have 
really tough opinions. It does not mean she's a wallflower because she is everything but. Um, we have a true partnership. Like, it, it is a true partnership. And sometimes she's dragging me up by the belt. And sometimes I'm dragging her up by the belt. But we both have really high expectations in terms of who we want to be as a couple and how we want to live. And, and I think that's been a, it's been an unbelievable friendship. And, and I, I, it, it hasn't been all bliss. And, and, and we've gone through our, our times that haven't been perfect. Uh, but, but generally, the trajectory is up. And, and it's because we're both, we both are learners, lifelong learners. And we're both interested uh, rather than being interesting. And, um, and I think that helps us drive forward together. But it's, you know, it's, 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 it's amazingly challenging and amazingly fun and amazingly hard and amazingly worth it. So it sounds like you've learned a lot from your wife, Lisa, right? Yes. You could say that for sure. There are other instances in today's conversation where you've brought up men who've given you advice. Yeah. Would you say that there's somebody in your life that you would say, this person has been a longtime mentor to me and what did they teach you and how did you implement it? I mean, I had so many, many incredible mentors. Um, David Stern, the former commissioner of the NBA, kind of a famous guy in my business, the sports business. And, and he, the, the big thing, I mean, look, I, he, he was an amazing, he was a giant of a man, short, but a giant of a man, giant personality. And maybe the meanest man I've ever met. I mean, he was really mean and nasty, like <laughs> old school, like yell or screamer in your face, screaming obscenities. Real fun, fun to work in that environment. But, um, <laughs> but what I did learn were a couple of things. One is like, he was a learner. I, you've heard me say that three times now. I just think like one of the secrets to life is you, you're interested and you want to learn. And we would, we would get on a plane. I traveled quite a bit with him for a few years and we would get on a private plane. So we'd get on the plane and everybody would run to the back because he was so nasty. And I would just sit right across from him because I thought I'm 30 years old. This is the greatest guy in the history of my business. I'll take the beating. If it's a four hour trip, I'll take a 30 minute beating to get three and a half hours of, of learn. But what was interesting, and it was, it was exactly that ratio. But I get on the plane, and he was an old school guy, I'd rip out articles in newspapers, and he, he'd walk on a plane with you know, a nine inch stack of articles to read. And, and he wasn't just reading about sports or business, it was life sciences and geopolitical. Like when, you know, he had an office in the, in the 80s in China when nobody, that wasn't even a mark, it wasn't even on the, on the radar of any other sports leagues. Uh, when, when Magic Johnson um, contracted the HIV virus, he knew exactly what to do. And so he, he actually used the NBA as a platform to change the international um, dialogue on, on AIDS. So, he, and, and, and like, I'd like to think he was just smart, but he was just interested. So he knew. And so, so that's one thing from him I, I've learned quite a bit from. Um, he also, like as nasty as he was, like anytime something went wrong, he was the first one there. And I, and I like that. Like talk about what's most important or like being loyal or, having your back or whatever, whatever those, whatever those, those cute sayings are that we throw around. He had it. Um, Seth Berger is a guy who I just got off the phone with. He founded a company called and one, which won't mean anything to you, but it's a big, it's the number two sneaker company in the world behind Nike for some period of time. And then they sold. I remember. Do you remember one? Yeah. yeah. So Seth's the founder of and one, a dear, dear friend. And, um, and he always taught me that there's three things. And I was like, what? He used to say it all the time. And his point was, and this ended up being proven in, in, in science, but, but, you know, like what happens when you run, run a company or you're an executive in a company or you're trying to run a ward or you're, you know, running a, a foundation or whatever you're doing, it's like there are usually three things that, that if you do well, you're going to be extraordinarily successful. And what happens, especially when you're young and you get put in these roles, is you do everything else because you have a vision of what a president is or a CEO is or a head of a division is or a vice president is, and that's what you do. When actually it's these three things. And uh, there's a great executive coach, Brendan Burchard, who I worked with for several months, who's an amazing guy and became a dear friend. And he's done so much research on this. And it's high performers spend 65% or more of their time on the three things that are most important, which I, I just love the notion of that. And his big vision was like, and now you have to audit your calendar, which I did. Mine was 23%, by the way, for those auditing at home. So you literally just have to go through your calendar and say, put the three things that you think are most important in terms of being successful and they just put your hours and see how you do. And it is frightening. And then you have to, he, what he said to me in my first, first meeting was, so you have to decide, like, either change what's most important. And I was like, I'm not changing what's most important. I know. He said, or change your process. But it's your choice. 
So be intentional, which I, lo- I love the notion of that learning. But Seth was the first one to like zero me in on, okay, find those three things. And that applies to relationships and applies to home, which I love. Do you want to share with us what your three things are? Right now? Yeah. It's different right now. So one is like always on the relationship, I always my wife. If that relationship is sideways, I'm sideways. So the way I do it is I have three relationships that I have to focus on, okay? And mine right now are Lisa, Eliza, which is my youngest, and Alexa is my oldest, okay? So those are my three. And I know it sounds obvious. My girls, they shift in and out. And sometimes it's a brother, sometimes it's a friend, sometimes it's a those, but my wife, she's always the relationship one. Sometimes my mom, but my wife always was always on the list. Um, in terms of work wise, now it's a little complicated for me just because I'm my, my life is different. So one thing is what I'm calling I would, my list. It says landing the plane, and that means I have a deal and I need to land that deal. And so more and more of my time right now, like in the last thirty days, has been landing the plane. Um, so I think that's about. 80, from a work standpoint, 80%. And then there are two deals that I have and two of my other um, early stage companies that I'm trying to do before that land lanes, lands. So th- those are my three things on the work side. Cool. Thanks for sharing that with us. Oh, wait, one more. Yeah. On the personal side too. I just, I don't want to miss on this. And so everybody, like three personal things. For me, it's something from my mind, something from my body, and something from my soul every day. So it's like body for me is always exercise. I wish I could eat better. I, I just, I don't have the gear, okay? If you put a pizza here, I'd eat the whole thing. You know, <laughs> trade chocolate chip cookies, I'd maul them. Um, so I know I have to exercise every day. Good for my mind, good for my, good for my, um, for my soul too. Um, you know, I, I know, I know you do some, some faith-based stuff here. When I talk to companies about the soul, because it's really, some people don't want to talk about like faith and, 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 and Christ and, uh, when it comes to work. And I, I just say like, look, scripture, prayer, all that stuff, going to church, that works for me. It doesn't work for everybody. And I'm okay. It's okay. But you still have to find stillness. So, for me, that's my soul. I have to nourish it. Like I listen to a church talk a day. Right now, so I'm just rolling through conference talks. Before that, I did like, I, I just picked a prophet. So it was President Nelson. I just listened to all his talks for a month. So one day, so 30 talks in 30 days. It's kind of a cool way to do it. So for me, I'm just, I know I have to nurture my soul, like consciously nurture it. Because my, you know, I'm not, I'm not, my, my brain does not set there naturally. Um, and then, and then for my, for my mind, I want to be learning something every day. I know that sounds so obvious, but it's like, I think in particular when you're working, you get so tunnel vision on your job or your career or your, your podcast, and you're like, yeah, well, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. It's like, no, what are you doing outside that? One TED Talk, one article. Like, what are you interested in? What are you passionate about? When you ask kids, it's the best question to ask a kid. And that's what I was grinding my youngest daughter on for like six months. I'm like, find something. I don't care what it is. It doesn't have to be anything I like. I'll, I'll adopt it just because you like it. It can't be stranger things. I love stranger It's wonderful. That can't be what you're passionate about. It could be, you could be interested in it. You could love it. You could follow the kids on Instagram. I don't care. But what are you learning and interested in? Anyway, she found, she found something, which is great. But, but the notion of just like mind, body, soul every day, that's my personal one for me. So who influenced you as you were growing up? Like who was it that made you, helped you make become who you are today. You know, now you've had life, you believe in lifetime learning and feels to me like every year you're becoming a little bit different person, but where did that base come from of who you are? Yeah. So I'm very fortunate to come from a, a really strong family. Um, both my folks are PhDs, um, which is, they would describe our house as a laboratory. <laughs> uh, we had family meetings before, you know, um, where they were talking about those in the seventies. Um, so there were five of us within six years. So very, you know, there were a lot of us. Um, my folks both worked full time. Um, my mom started, she, um, she had two schools and then she went to go work with my dad, which was, she, uh, he was a leadership development uh, trainer and they worked with Xerox and ADP and Texaco and um, all these big companies that were global. So, so in many ways, um, my, my folks were the biggest influences in my life. Um, but probably practically it was my brothers and sister because I, I don't, we were Latsky kids. I mean, I don't want to say we raised each other, but we were left to our own devices quite a bit. Like we didn't have, my parents weren't saying, did you do your homework? Like, I don't think they even ever saw my grades. I mean, it, the expectation was you were going to do the best you could. Like we talked about that a lot. Um, but um, but I, I think like I have a lot of memorable moments. I mean, one is my dad 
he used to say to me every day, and I was a really like of the five of us, I was the most troubled kid. Um, I had a lot of energy and they, you know, they were trying all 70 stuff. So, you know, they took me off sugar and they sent me to a, you know, a shrink. You know, now it's a therapist or a coach, but you know, it's someone to talk to. They sent me to a priest or a Catholic. Um, they sent me to my room every day for like a year. So they didn't know what to do. Um, but as much as like, I felt like, you know, like I couldn't fit in. I felt like I, I didn't fit in this family. I didn't fit in this world. I didn't know like what my place was. I, I never quite measured up to anybody else in any way. And, um, but my, my, both my mom and dad in different ways. Um, my dad would tell me at least once a day that, um, that I was special and I could do anything I want to do in the world. And what a, what a, what a wonderful message to hear from your dad. And my mom, she, um, I have her, actually a small, like five foot two Italian woman with just a bundle of energy. I mean, if you, when I saw at 13 years old, I saw her train. She was, we were out in college. She flew me out to Colorado. I was causing a lot of problems. She's like, I want you to come see me what I do. Because I said some stuff I should have said to my mom. She's like, let's go. Let's get on a plane. I'm like, I have school. She's like, you're going with me tomorrow. So I went with her. And I just saw her in front of this room. Of like, you know, at the time, it was like old school. It's like, you know, 100 white men, Xerox. You know, and she's training them. And she's making them laugh and making them cry. And she's got this room at the palm of her hand. I'm like, holy mackerel, that's my mom. You know, so... But she, like, had this way of saying, you know, being different is wonderful. It's your gift. Now, I just love that. Um, because uh, my, my daughters, they're all, they couldn't be more different. Like, they're, they're special, um, but they're, they're different. And I think that as parents... Uh, we can we can lean in a bit. Um, we can the kids that come over our house know whether they're our children or or their friends. Um, they're not getting a lot of positive feedback. They're not you know especially girls. They're not building each other up. They're they're stretched on social media, and they're they're feeling their inadequacies. They're feeling where they're light or they're not measuring up or the party they didn't go to or the party they had that their friend threw and they can't believe. You didn't get invited and they're feeling ugly and they're feeling dumb and they're feeling awkward. And, and we need to do the best we can with kids in our lives, whether it be our own or, or, or kids just to make them feel loved and okay. So mm -hmm. I think that was, those were the gifts from my parents. Thanks for sharing that. It's good stuff. You're right. The world, the world is a little harder on the kids. Certainly socially. I see. My kids dealing with all of that. And, and you wonder sometimes, I, I often wonder how hard should I be on them? How non hard should I be on them? Right. My, my oldest, like I'm on her about her grades. And then I'm thinking, does it really matter what her grades are as long as she's doing her best? She's so special. Yeah. She's so amazing. Like my oldest, I'm always on her. Uh -huh. And yet I'm positive that she is, she's the most street smart she's the one that doesn't really have to work hard and she still gets good grades kind of a thing. But I'm on her all the time because I see the potential. Yeah. Right. And, and, and it's a balancing act of, am I being too hard on her? You know, and I usually go back to, well, if I just love her and tell her she's special and tell her she can do anything, then everything will work out fine. Even if she, even if she's getting a D in a class. Yeah. It's, it's hard though. You, I mean, I remember I'll give you a specific story on grades, which is going to make you wince. Um, and you're a really successful guy and you have a strong presence. I can, you know, and, and so, and that, that is more on your kids, more pressure on your kids than you can possibly fathom. And I remember my daughter coming home one day and we just moved in. And, and in fairness to my kids, like they have not had an easy, stable life. Okay. They have wonderful things, you know, but we've moved, you know, my oldest went to three middle schools. Hmm. She has no chance. At, at that point, like you have no chance. Right. Um, and so we get to a place where we settle in her third middle school and she's struggling in school. And I say, semester grades, four semesters. I say, all right, let's, let's walk through your grades. Let's walk through the teacher concept. Private school. Like, the great thing about private school is you get whatever resources you want. You get access to the teachers, extra help. They'll do anything. And I was like, oh, let's take a look at your grades. And she, like, lost her mind on me. I was like, whoa. I was like, hey, let's go. What's, what's up here? 
She's like, I'm not you, Dad. And I was like, whoa, whoa, I don't want you to be me. I want you to be you, best version of you. I, I'm here to help you be the best version of you. And, and look, I have type A crazy in me. Like, I, I, that's what I am. Like, my expectations for myself are harder than, like, higher than anybody else's. I have a crazy drive to do what I want to do when I want to do it. And, and I know that my, my daughters have seen that, you know, and I understood it. I, I, I couldn't internalize it at, in the beginning, but I understood it. And so I was like, well, what, what's the problem? And I said, I don't care. I, I gave the speech. Like, I don't care what grade you get. I, I honestly don't care. I said, the only thing I care about is that you work hard. That's it. So she said to me some things that weren't very nice. And I said, hon, here's the deal. It's like, I don't have to look at your grades. Like, I honestly, like, every semester, let's just get together and say, like, are you working hard or not? Now, this, this just sounds like either, like, a brilliant move or a terrible move. <laughs> and in what, some ways, it was brilliant. In some ways, it was terrible. And let me tell you, that the end of the story is even worse. It makes me even look worse. But I'm, I'm going to go with it. And so, so we go down this path. And she's struggling mightily in school. And, she's, and my, only, um, my only regret is that she graduated from high school thinking she was, and I quote, dumb. Okay? Now, I hadn't looked at her grades. I had no idea what her grades were. Um, and I accidentally opened them up her senior year. I thought it was a bill from the school. And I opened them. And I was like, I went up to her room. I was like, hey, I'm so sorry. I, she's like, I don't care, Dad. You know, whatever. So now this is a kid who's like, she's, she's, I mean, ama- like you said, right? she's amazing. So like she walk into a room and she lights up a room. She's like starring in a play. She wins like a national art award. She's like starting on a basketball team. She's like, you know, homecoming queen, captain cheerleaders. I mean, this kid is like here, but in the classroom, like it was a grind. Okay. Now she's got, I have ADD. She, I know she has it. We, we didn't diagnose it, of course, because we know everything. Why would we ever have anybody, anybody uh, diagnose anything? Anyway. So, so she, she, um, you know, I had a conversation with her just to tell you where it was. I was like, look, you have to graduate from high school. You know what I mean? Like, you got to do what you need to do to get through this. So anyway, so she did. Everything was fine. And, um, and then she gets to college, and she gets tested, and she's learning disability. So, right. So now, how's that, how's that as a dad moment, you know? And so now... Now, I didn't pressure her on grades. I didn't. Thank goodness. But my instinct was, because my instinct is, is like, yo, it's not that hard. You, get, you go to class, you listen, you participate once in a while, you come home, you're disciplined, you prepare for a test, you go in, you take it. You need extra help, you ask for it. You want a tutor? I'll give you one. That's how my brain works. That's okay? pretty much what I sound like. So. Right. And so he, but here's the, here's the path. Here's the, here's the crazy faith path. Um, Dave Butler, who's an incredible institute teacher at UVU, does this thing called Don't Miss This. If, if you don't, haven't watched it, check it out. Um, it's like a, a, a daily faith-based thing to prepare you for the lesson for the next week. Anyway, I was watching. He did an institute in class at UVU that I went to. Uh, he is Thursday night, 7 o'clock. It's brilliant. It's like the best hour you'll ever spend in your life. And he was talking about that story where um, Savior says, you know, it's, it's harder. I'm going to butcher it because I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do the best I can here. So it's, it's harder for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get to heaven. Remember that story? Yes. It always bothered me, that story. You know? And it's like, I, like, I think it's ridiculous. Like, honestly, like, I was kind of like, well, hey, I'm working hard. I'm finding success. Part of that is, is a payoff. And whether that's good or bad, that's life. And, like, so I don't, you know, and so, so I never understood. Like, it never really, you know, worked for me. And he said his, his, his lesson uh, about a month ago was, no, you're, you're missing the point. It's like what he's saying, he's not saying because how much money you have. It's not saying because you didn't work hard. What he's saying is, is that what it takes to be successful is you have to control everything. And you've got to have that plan. And you've got to do it yourself. And you've got to set the path. And you've got to go. And you've got to get it done. And so you're not, you're not, you're not. That's, that's the opposite of submitting and having like true faith that the Lord will take care of you. And he's going to do his part. And I was like, oh, totally get it. And how does that transition to my daughter? It's like, well, there's so many parallels there. It's absolutely frightening. And so we, we people who are, have that kind of drive, have a really complicated challenge when we're raising kids. Because, you know, and, and don't think I haven't looked around saying, hey, like, get to work. Like, you want a vacation to Hawaii? 
get back to work. That it doesn't happen by accident. You know, mm-hmm. it's not just going to happen. So there is some of that. And I tried to like compress that part of me or suppress that part of me and just push them to find something that they're passionate about and something they love. And so, you know, if I had to do it all over again with my oldest daughter, um, she happened to find her, her niche and is doing really, by the way, ironically, fast forward, she's getting three sevens and three eights in college, which is to me, it's like so beyond me that she figured out a way, okay, to get there on her own by herself. Um, and I'm really proud of her, but I would have been just as proud if she had a two one, to be honest with you because like, I think, I think our definition of success and the way the education work world works today does not reflect at least the world of success. I'll put that in air quotes that I know I'm not sure there's a correlation. Um, now it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't work hard at school. If you're a kid listening to this, and it doesn't mean as a parent, you shouldn't have expectations for your kids because that's the way the world works. There's some things you just have to do to go through life and, and do more than just check the box. And, and, and you want to you want to walk through life thinking like, okay, I can do this. I worked hard and I got X. I'm successful because of Y. I put this work in. Um, but at the end of the day, like, I would much rather <clears throat> have had her lean into art and music, you know, which she didn't because it wasn't that kind of school or, or something that was intuitive to her where she could excel because confidence and repetition are what drives success, right, for young people. And without that confidence, you got to work three times as hard because you're fighting yourself. So many good, so many good things. I want my kids to listen to this podcast. Um, you've given me a lot of things to think about uh, that I want to implement in my house with my teenagers. So thank you for that. At the end of every podcast, we always ask our guest what they think it means to be a gentleman. So we want to give you the opportunity to answer that question. Okay. It's a really complicated question. It should be a much simpler answer. But I'm going to try. To me, it means that you don't put yourself first. You do the best you can to create an incredible world for those in your sphere, whether that, in my case, is my wife and my daughters. You are trying to help lift up the lives of others, that you feel that the things that you do well are blessings and gifts, and the things that you don't are things that you can work harder on. It is a magical question. It's a complex one. It is one. Yes. And, and that is, for your information, that is the reason why it's called The Gentleman Project is because one of my young boys at the age of five asked me what a gentleman was. And I didn't know how to answer the question. So I decided that there needed to be some extra effort put in on my part to be more purposeful in teaching him what a gentleman was. So that's why we ask that question at the end of every podcast. And it's amazing to me, the, the number of different answers that we've received for everyone's information. There will someday be a book using some of the stories from this podcast, the definitions of this podcast, all these wonderful answers that we've had from the people on the podcast. So we can't thank you enough for coming in. Um, you know, you're from New Jersey. We're sitting in Salt Lake. You're taking time to speak to us and our audience. Uh, So we just are very grateful for you. Thank Thank you. you. I'm grateful for you and the work you're doing. Keep it up. Thanks, Scott. You were amazing, by the way. Thank you for uh, giving us all of your knowledge and thoughts and feelings and being vulnerable and open. And you were such a great uh, podcast guest. Thank you. Thank you. And you are excellent hosts. And I wish you the best of luck going forward. Thanks, Scott. Thanks, everybody, for joining us on the Gentleman Project podcast. If you like this, please like it, share it, pass the word along. Scott is very active on Twitter. He's also very active on LinkedIn. If you are looking for something that's going to lift you up, inspire you, and be something good in your news feed, like him on Twitter, follow him on LinkedIn, and, uh, and you'll be glad you did. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. I'm Kirk Chug. And I'm Corey Moore. Be where your feet are.